Welcome to Heartlift. I'm Jill Morricone, and I'm so glad that you have joined us today. We're on a journey toward hope, toward healing, toward the transformation that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to work in your heart and in mine as women, as daughters of God. If you're just joining us, we're in the middle of several programs, a discussion on the topic of purity. I know purity can be a difficult and sensitive topic, but the beautiful thing is that the Lord Jesus Christ wants to cleanse us. Whatever our impurity, He can take it away. Last week, last program, we discussed the first three keys, the first three steps toward experiencing purity, experiencing purity of heart and life. And purity is really a measure of how much we accept and receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The first three steps to recap, number one is to seek forgiveness. Go to God right now and say, God, you know the shame all over me. You know the junk in my past. Will you forgive me? And he says, yes, immediately. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He will forgive us and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Number two is to surrender. Surrender those lustful thoughts. Surrender those emotions. Or if you're currently acting out with somebody, surrender that person and break off that relationship before God. Now we know we cannot do that of our own strength. We go to God and we say, God, we need your help. I ask that you take this from me. And sometimes we surrender and those thoughts, those emotions, those feelings, they pop right back up again. But we go back to God and we re-surrender. Number three is to behold Jesus. We don't want to just surrender and leave our hearts in open vacuum. We want to behold Jesus. We behold him in his word. We behold him with scripture, with song, through prayer. Today, we're going to be discussing the next four steps to experiencing purity of life and heart. Our scripture for today is Romans 13, verse 14. Romans 13, 14, and I love this scripture. If you have your Bible, open along and follow along. If not, you can always jot down the reference to look it up later. The Bible says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for your purity. We thank you that you can exchange our filthy rags for your dazzling white robe of righteousness. We thank you that nothing we've done in the past can be too bad that you cannot cover and you cannot forgive. Right now, we open up our hearts to receive what you want to give us today from your word, and we thank you in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. One of my friends, she's actually one of my very good girlfriends, is a beautiful picture of what Jesus is like. She ministers to other people. She walks in authenticity. She's not one of these fake Christians who pace on a smile and it's not really genuine. She's real. She's genuine. She's honest about where she's been and she shares, this is where God is taking me. This is where God has led me. Hers is a beautiful experience. She shares with other people often her story. She ministers. She blesses my heart incredibly. In her past, she was an alcoholic. And she is quite honest about that. And she shares about that. But God broke that addiction off of her life. In addition, as well as that alcoholism from her past, and this was years ago, she also had a love addiction. Now you might say, what in the world is the difference between a sex addiction and a love addiction? I think a sex addiction has more to do with an object and maybe you would disassociate a little bit from the person. It's more, you view that as an object. A love addiction is a little bit different. And she dealt with this. She said that she would get a sort of high or from those romantic fantasies, from those thoughts, from going out, and sleeping with her neighbor or whoever it happened to be. She was seeking sex in order to feel better inside. 
in order to fill whatever that brokenness was, whatever that pain was in her heart and in her life. You know what the beautiful thing is? The Lord gave her deliverance. The Lord freed her. If you knew her today, you would have no idea that that was a battle, ever a battle in her life. You would have no idea that she ever struggled with that. The Lord Jesus filled her heart. He cleansed her. He filled her with His grace and with His comfort for all of those broken places in her heart. And she is a new creation in Christ Jesus. And now she ministers in a beautiful, effective way to many men and women. It's an incredible story of what God can do. Now, you might say, I don't have a love addiction, and I'm not acting out sexually right now, but my th my, I struggle with my thoughts. That was exactly where I was, and I shared that a couple of programs ago. I won't share the story again now, but my battle was with my fantasies in my mind. My lust was internal. It was in my head. It was a result of those romance novels I read or those soap operas that I used to watch. And God said, Jill, I want to break that off of your life. Whatever your battle is, God says, I came to set you free. I came to bring deliverance to your heart. So we're looking at the four keys. We looked at three last program. This program is the next four keys in our battle to freedom from pure freedom from sin to purity of heart. Number one, guard the avenues of the mind. Galatians 6, 7 and 8 says, what we feed grows, what we starve dies. In essence, it says that. It's the law of sowing and reaping. What we sow, if we sow to the flesh, we're going to of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the spirit, we're going to of the spirit reap life everlasting. Whatever you feed in your soul, in your spirit is going to grow. And whatever you choose to push aside and to starve, that is going to die. Romans 13, 14, that was our opening scripture. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Practically speaking, how are we to accomplish this? How do we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and how do we make no provision for the flesh for that thing that would, that would feed our sexual thoughts or those fantasies? How do we do that? I think in my own experience, the solution, how we do this, is to remove the temptation as far as possible from our homes. What do I mean by that? If you're struggling and you're addicted to a certain program on the TV, get rid of it. Then you don't have that open temptation in your home. Maybe it's a magazine subscription that you have to one of those racier magazines and that feeds the lust in your heart cancel that subscription. Maybe it's a book that you have in your home that, that feeds that romantic fantasy. Throw the book away. I used to think, I I'm strong in Jesus. I'm strong in Jesus, and I'm okay. These things won't tempt me anymore. And I could go weeks, months, and even years without even maybe pulling that book off the bookshelf. But then in a moment, in a weak moment, it would be there right there on the shelf, staring me in the face. How much better to remove that temptation from your home at all? I know that this principle seems harsh. You might say, Jill, that's a little harsh, but I can tell you, it works. Now, how do you decide what's appropriate for you? How do you decide, what do I watch? What do I listen to? What movies do I see? What, what music do I listen to? What books do I read? What TV shows am I gonna watch? Philippians 4, 8 gives us a really good litmus test. Philippians 4, verse 8 is a great lit litmus test for this. The Bible says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. So how do we know? We go to God and say, is this honest? Is this going to strengthen my purity? Is this just? And when you go down that list, you'll find that 
there's a few that might automatically be eliminated. I think the key, nobody can come into your home and say, you should do this and you shouldn't do that, because that's control, and we are not talking about that. I think the key is you yourself, go to God and ask Him, and keep an open mind, an open heart, to be open to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell you, to what the Holy Spirit wants to teach you. I know sometimes I'll read a book or um, watch a movie, and maybe you have this experience. Say I watch a certain movie, and when I'm done, at the end of the couple hours, you know what happens? I think, wow, I want to follow God more. Wow, I feel encouraged in my own walk with God. Wow, I want to be a better wife. I want to witness for Jesus more effectively. If I watch a movie and it has that effect on me, I know that's a good movie. That's for me, that's a good movie. Now what if I watch a movie and when I'm done I think, why doesn't my husband treat me like that? Man, and I start fantasizing about some romantic thing going on with a movie or boy, that kissing scene, I think I'm gonna replay that in my mind a bit. Or it starts to feed some of that lust in my heart, then I know for me, that's a movie I'm going to struggle with. That's a movie I need to be careful of and I need to say, okay, I'm going to make that decision and I will get rid of that. I think the more we seek God's face, the more we just desire to serve Him, He's going to show you. Open up your heart to Him and He will reveal it to you. So number one, we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We get rid of those temptations in our home. We make no provision for the flesh. Number two, serve Jesus where you're at. Philippians 4, verse 11. It says, not that I speak in regard of need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in, therewith to be content. Serve Jesus where you're at. If you're single and you wish that you could be married, instead of sitting in self-pity, pining, wishing for something you don't have, surrender that to God and seek to serve Jesus where you're at right now. If you're married, thank God for the husband he gave to you. Don't pine for something else or some other fantasy. Thank God for who he blessed you with and seek to serve God together with who God has given you. Now, maybe you might be saying, Jill, my husband's not a believer. My husband doesn't believe in Jesus. I'm serving God by myself. And I know many of you might be in that category. If that is the case, come before God and just say, God, I'm choosing to honor my husband and at the same time, fill me with your joy and help me to serve you completely. Number one, we make no provision for the flesh. We put away those temptations, those things in our home that are especially um, hurtful. Number two, we just serve Jesus where we're at. Number three, become accountable. I believe addiction thrives in secrecy. If you're married and your husband is open to talking with you about your struggles, share with him. If you're not, find a trusted, godly woman that you can share with. Find a Christian counselor. Those are all good options. My one counsel would be, don't go sharing with another man who's not your husband because that's gonna lead to some sort of intimacy and right now you're struggling to break that emotional bondage that you're in. Pray together. Seek God's face together over what you're struggling with. I think an accountability partner is huge. In my own life, I shared my battle with my husband, Greg. And then we pray together, and I sought to be accountable to him. In addition, I found a godly woman that I pray with every week. Every week we pray together, and she's my prayer partner. Every um, week she will ask me, Jill, how can I pray for you this week? And I'll say, you know what? I'm really struggling this week with whatever it is. Maybe I'm feeling jealous about a certain situation or a person and I'll say, pray that the Lord Jesus breaks off that jealousy from my life. Maybe there's pride in my heart and I say, I see it cropping up and I don't want it. Pray for that.
Maybe I'm not having joy in Jesus this week. Can I say, please pray for me that I experience anew the joy in Jesus, the joy of my salvation. Maybe it, it's something else. Maybe it's dealing with lust. Whatever it is, I share with her. Then she shares with me, this was how my week was. This is what God did in my week. And then this is my battle. This is my struggle. Jill, would you pray for me here? And then we pray together on the phone every week. It's a beautiful time. It encourages me. It strengthens me. It's changed me. I know it has. She is a beautiful picture of Jesus, and I can be honest with her. I think there's five steps when you are looking. When you're looking, when you're analyzing, finding an accountability partner, there's five things to look for. Number one, you want to find someone who's godly. That is important. Now, you don't need someone perfect. Nobody is perfect. So if you're looking for a perfect accountability partner, they don't exist. So just scratch that idea. But look for someone who is at least seeking God. Obviously, you don't want someone who is attained because if we think we've attained, then we know for certain we have not. So just look for someone whose heart follows after God, who every day wants to seek more of his face, who wants to become more like Jesus. Number one, find someone who's godly. Number two, you want someone who's confidential. This is huge. Huge. You don't want your struggles passed around the church. The worst thing could be you sharing with a woman who is godly, but you could say, oh, I, I'm struggling here. Would you please pray for me? And the next time you come to church, the pastor talks to you about your own struggle or another member over here and you think, I thought it was safe. I thought she was confidential. Now, if the woman you choose is truly godly, then we pray that she would be confidential as well. But that would be a key. And sometimes we say, how do we even know who we can trust? How do I know if this woman is confidential? Share a little bit at the beginning. And then if you find that they are trustworthy, share just a little bit more. Sometimes we could overshare at the beginning. So I think trust takes time to build. I would say it's going to take a year or two before you truly know. But in the beginning, share just a bit. And then over time, you can share more. Godly, confidential, safe. Safe is a lot like confidential, but to me, it's a little different. To me, it would be someone who does not belittle your struggle. You don't want someone who's going to make fun of you, someone who's going to say, oh, you're dealing with that. That's nothing. You should have seen what I dealt with. You want someone who won't belittle what you are dealing with, someone who's encouraging, someone who will acknowledge and affirm the progress that you are making. That's key. And number five, seek a woman who's prayerful, a woman who doesn't need to know all the answers but someone who's willing to pray with and for you. First, we go before God and we seek forgiveness. This was last program. Second, we surrender those lustful thoughts or that person to God. Third, we behold Jesus. Then, dealing with today's program, we put behind, we put behind any of those things that are in our home that are tempting us. We don't make any provision for the flesh. We serve Jesus where we're at. We become accountable. Finally, we don't compare ourselves to others. I was, when I was teaching school, I work at 3ABN full time now, but I taught music lessons at our local church school for about 10 years. And when I was teaching, one of the little kids he was probably nine or 10. He came into school and he's telling all of his friends about this movie that he saw and he was all excited. And it was not a bad movie, I'm just being honest. It was not a bad rating, it was a wholesome movie. But when he shared, in my heart I was troubled because I've seen that movie before and I knew if I went back and watched it again, it's gonna rekindle all of that old lust in my heart. It's going to bring it back to the surface. And so I complained to my prayer partner. Remember the accountability partner we just talked about? And I complained to her and I said, how come a 10-year-old kid can watch the same thing that would bother me? 
can watch the same thing that would stir up that old lust in my heart. And you know what she said? You don't compare yourself to others, Jill. All you need to do is look to Jesus. If he can watch that and that feed his soul, praise the Lord. That's wonderful. You're not accountable for anybody else. You don't compare yourself and say, I do this, you don't. We get into pride, we get into judging, we get into a critical spirit if we get into that. She said, simply go to God. God knows the way my heart works. God knows my own battles in the past with impurity. And so he has a special guard over my heart. And that's okay. That's not only okay, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. So don't, in your own experience, don't feel like if so-and-so does it, then it's fine for me. And it might be fine for you. And that's wonderful. The key is go to God. He knows the battles you have fought in your past. Nobody else knows them like Jesus knows them. No one ever knows us as truly inside as the Lord Jesus, because he made us. He knows all about our struggles. So come to him and say, is there anything that you want me to get rid of? Is there anything that would pull me back to that old cauldron of lust? Is there anything that you say um, I need to get rid of? Go to God, he'll show you. And then the key is ask. We, sometimes we can't even get rid of that stuff. We just ask God for the grace, the courage, and the strength to get rid of it. We're going to take a short break here, and when we come back, we're going to do our practical application for this week, something that you can take with you this week in your own journey with freedom from lust. Welcome back. We're talking today about purity, purity of heart, purity of life. Remember, purity is a measure of how much we accept the righteousness of Christ. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how bad, shameful, condemning you feel your past is, the Lord Jesus says, I want to clean you up. I want to clothe you with my dazzling white robe. And you are God's princess, pure and white. We talked today about several steps, several keys that we can use in our own journey to purity of heart and life. There's a scripture that I love. This is in 1 Corinthians 4, and I want to read this to you. 1 Corinthians 4, it's the second part of verse 9. The Bible says, we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. You know what? God changes us. God transforms us. God pulls us out of the mud and covers us with his righteous white robe. Why? So that we can boast about how pure we are? Of course not. It's so that he can get glory and honor so that someone can look at you and say, you used to be this way and all of a sudden you're different. All of a sudden you're pure. What happened? If God can do that for you, then I want to follow him too. God cleanses us and changes us and then almost puts us on display for angels and for men, for people to see what the power of God can do, what the transforming power of the word can affect in your life and in mine. We talked today about making no provision for the flesh, putting those things in our home away from us, putting them away, those things that maybe would feed that lust in our heart and in our soul. This week, I want to encourage you to go through your home, check out, maybe it's a TV show, maybe it's a movie, check out your books, look at your magazines, look at your CDs, check the internet and the sites that you go to. See if any of those things are feeding the lust in your heart. Only God can truly tell you, is this something that's feeding that or is it not? So go to God with an open heart. Go before him and say, God, I only want in my home what is pleasing to you. I was doing a, a woman's retreat. And we, we took the woman, we were talking about this concept of purity and how God wants to recreate in us 
his purity. We talked about making no provision for the flesh and what were those things in our homes that God wants us to get rid of. We had a bonfire. We went outside. They had a bonfire there. It was by a lake. And the woman wrote down on a scrap of paper, of course they're not at their home, they can't physically get rid of stuff, but they wrote down on a scrap of paper, a person, a thing, or an emotion that God was asking them to surrender, that God was asking them to give to him. Maybe they were in the midst of an affair and God was saying, break off that relationship. They wrote that person's name down on the scrap of paper. Maybe they had an addiction to soap operas like I did, and God was saying, get rid of that TV. Maybe it was some other type of emotion. Whatever it was, they wrote it down. We tossed our scraps of paper into the bonfire, and then we sang, all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Now there's nothing obviously radical about throwing that in the fire. It's symbolic. It symbolizes giving that to Jesus or going to God and saying, I can't even give it to you. Would you take it from me? So first this week, go through your home, see what's in your home and see what is God asking you to get rid of. Number two, Pray about an accountability partner. Pray for a godly woman to come into your home, to come into your heart, to come into your life that you can pray with. You can pray over the phone. You don't even have to meet in person. Someone who will be safe, someone who's confidential, someone who's godly, who seeks after God's heart, someone who's encouraging, someone who will encourage you in your walk with Jesus. Our next program, next week, we're going to still be discussing the topic of purity, but not from the aspect of our own hearts. We're going to be looking at how do we guard our brother's heart. Our closing scripture, as always, is Romans 15, verse 13. And I love this scripture. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit.